Thomas Merton. The quietness and the hiddenness and the placidity of truly good people trying to proclaim the glory of God in their ordinary lives. Um, we hear just millions of different voices every day, and in the midst of all that information coming at us, we have to listen carefully to the voice of God. And every refusal hardens us more and more against his grace. And yet he continues to speak to us. I'm quoting Merton, by the way. He is without mercy. Glorious mother of God, shall I ever again distrust you? Shall I ever look anywhere else but in the face of your love to find true counsel and to know my way in all the days and moments of my life? Now that just speaks to me in volumes. So one of the more important spiritual autobiographies of the 20th century was this book written by a contemplative monk. His name was Frater, which is brother, Louis Merton, or otherwise known as Thomas Merton. The fact that it had been written by, in an enclosed religious environment, um, the author's conversion to the Catholic faith was fairly sudden. His, his subsequent entrance into the, one of the church's most rigorous religious orders, the Trappist, so we could talk a little bit more about that, really made it a source of fascination. It sold 600,000 copies in the first year of publication. And when those, not just Gethsemane, but those other Trappist monasteries started getting flooded, flooded, in almost every briefcase, in almost every suitcase, was a copy of Seven Story Mountain. So people were just flooding to these religious centers, which were very rigorous. Now, you know it as well as I do. He was born in 1915, which, <clears throat> you know, that's not that long ago. In southern France, bohemian parents, the death of his mother, now his mother had a very strong personality <clears throat> um, when he was at the age of six in New York and his uh, subsequent intermittent, uh, disjointed really, he was reared by his artist father in France for two years, then he was in England. Um, and then after his father died of a brain tumor in 1931, he was allowed remarkable freedom, I mean almost like ridiculous <clears throat> amount of freedom. Probably what we would see in some parents today with a lot of, lot of affluence. Um, to just kind of live however he wanted to live. Um, and this man, <clears throat> Tom Bennett, um, a friend of his, his late father, his maternal grandfather provided him and his, his brother with a lot of money. I mean, constant funds. Um, for support, and they really did put much limitation at all. So Martin was filled with all kinds, Merton, excuse me, was filled with all kinds of whims. Um, remember those, eight, th th those years? So prior to starting at Cambridge, uh, he visited France, he visited Italy, he pursued his study there in Cambridge. He lived a very licentious lifestyle. And at the end of that university year, this was 1934, he accepted a suggestion from his guardian, why don't you go to America? the United States. There at Columbia University in 1938, he obtained the degree of Bachelor of Arts in English. Now one day, this has just happened to be the month of February 1937, he entered Scribner's. Anybody go to Scribner's? You gotta go to Scribner's. Huge bookstore, uh, very, very popular. I remember one time on senior bar, he was a year ahead of me at Catholic University, and uh, he said to me, I was just new to the priesthood. He said to me, okay, I want you to take me to Wall Street. And I want you to introduce me to your, some of your partners and some of your buddies. I said, you ready for this? Now, we were supposed to be at a convention there in New York. He was the Presbyterian Council president. I was the associate president of the diocese. He sent us out there to, you know, go to all these talks. And he wanted to ditch one of the talks. And he wanted to go meet Donald Trump, he wanted to go meet some of the various people in New York. And I said, okay, let's go. So we went. 
And uh, it was a rude awakening for me, for sure, because it was just a couple years removed. And in my mind, you ever go back to your old high school? Okay. You ever go back to an old parish? <laughs> Same type of thing. You go into these offices, they're, oh, Mr. Peck, oh, Mr. Peck. Well, you're not really Mr. Peck anymore, but that's who you were. I said, Mr. Peck, you know, we haven't seen you in a while. You know, how are things going? And that was about it. That conversation lasted about 15 seconds. And you thought, well, we, we drank a few beers together, you know, down at the pier. We did a lot, you know, went to each other's, yeah, whatever, bar mitzvahs, you name it. And so, uh, they're kids. And so you're going through these various offices and they're kind of dismissive because they're busy and you can't do much for them. Oh, there you go. Good. Okay, you guys know the, the stick here. And so it's all based on, what have you done for me? Okay, so you're going through office after office and he's going, wow, so yeah, that... I see Bowie Kuhn, you know, ex-commissioner of baseball. Wow. So you shared the same, yeah, we had the same secretary pull you. Yeah. Okay, you go walking through, it's going, wow, wow. And I'm just feeling this huge emptiness, like this huge hole. Like, I don't belong here. And this is really odd. So we come out of this city core building and everything, and there's Scribner's. And he just makes a beeline. And it, it is amazing, amazing bookstores. But you've got those all over New York City, and it's, it's just kind of exciting. But anyway, there's Martin. He picks up a copy of Etienne uh, Gilson's The Spirit of Medieval Philosophy. He didn't realize that any book on this subject would, be, would deal necessarily with you know, Catholicism and Catholic philosophy. And he discovered this nihil obstat, you know, in the book, and an imprimatur. And he says that he almost threw out the window as soon as he saw those two things. I I'm done with this. If it's got the seal of approval from these, the Catholic hierarchy, I want nothing to do with it. So by some actual grace, he, moved, he was moved to read it, and his eyes opened for the first time to Catholic philosophy. Here's a quote. The one big concept which I got out of the pages was to revolutionize my whole life. It is contained in one of those dry compounds that the scholastic philosophers were so prone to use. Aesthete simply means the power of being to exist absolutely in virtue of itself, requiring no cause, no other justification for its existence, except that its very nature is to exist. There can be only one such thing, and that is God. Remember, he had gone through that agnostic, atheistic, uh, actually he was still there in, in that phase of his life. We've all been there um, to some greater or lesser degree. And a friend, this doctor, uh, Brahmachara told Merton, and I quote, there are many beautiful mystical books written by the Christians. You should read St. Augustine's Confessions, he told him. And you should read The Imitation of Christ. He was moved. He said, I'll, I'll, I'll pick them up. And he was affected by them. And that's why we always encourage all of you here to have a very substantial Catholic library. And some of you are pros. My mother is a pro. She's a librarian, you know, that's her whole being. And what she does is she would put in a major intersection of the house, the big bookshelf. And of course, you go by this big bookshelf like six times a day. And, you, and she changes it all the time. So she's like, you should read this, you should read this, you should pull this. And then when you didn't pull enough, it would be found on your dresser. <laughs> she'd just stick it there and it would sit there for a couple days and then you know you'd start to pick it up and you we, we, we had this crazy notion in our house and I know I've shared it with you before but it really did end up helping me a great deal and the crazy notion is that we had 13 little bandits and the first group needed to start getting ready for bed at 8 o'clock the second would go to bed at 8.30 and then during these shifts would be all kinds of kissing and, you know, getting a little bit of water and making sure you use the restroom. It was, it was the same routine every night and making sure everything was good. And then the last group, which typically was us, at least this is where I remember it most astutely, was in high school and college. We had to go to bed at 9 o'clock. Now that's absolutely insane. Now what you got to do is everybody had their own bed, even though they were small bunk beds, you know, but you got your own bed and you got your own desk with a light on it, right? So you got to stay up as long as you were studying. Now, that was before iPads and iPods and all these various things. So we would study. Well, you see this book that's sitting on your desk or your dresser, right? And you just say, oh, okay, let me get this over with. 
you know, and you start to read it. And then, of course, you come down for the morning. I know I read this. And sometimes you'd be reading this until 1, 2 in the morning. Now, it's not the same as texting, okay? Because this is substantial. These are really substantial books. And then my parents, especially my mother, she would get up like 4.30 in the morning, you know, to make sure the dishes that had been already, you know, some of them you couldn't just... We didn't have dishwasher. I, we were the dishwashers. But you know, some of those wine glasses and stuff, you just can't. You, so she'd start putting all those things together a little more delicate. And then she would pray, and then she would get breakfast ready for all of us. And then my, and my dad, oh, he drove us nuts. Anybody ever let dad like this? He would sing, oh, what a beautiful morning. <laughs> like almost every day, and he cannot sing worth a lick. And he starts singing. Can I tell you it's like trains? Anybody ever grow up in a town of trains like Rochelle, Illinois, or trains like that? You start to miss the trains. How does that work? But you just grew up with trains. They almost like put you to sleep. You know, you grow up in certain parts of Chicago, whatever, you hear these trains. You're just used to trains. And all of a sudden, when you come back home, it's like, ah, oh, the trains. <laughs> it's like nuts. It really is. Well, the same with these lullabies. You start to miss these things sung. Now, my mom, she would sing lullabies all during the day while she was doing her work, you know? And there was the same lullaby she'd do in a rocking chair. It was very, very comforting, especially um, when she was singing because if she was quiet, that was not good. <laughs> okay? Um, nevertheless, that's what happened here. He said to, to Merton, grab confessions and grab imitation of Christ. So if you want to accuse me of torturing you with confessions again, or, hey, I'm in the long line of torturers. Uh, Merton was a man of incredible intellect and sensitivity. Remarkably well read, if eclectically so. He spoke, he read a number of languages. Um, I mean, several apart from English. And that's the incredible thing, isn't it? When you go to Europe, and many of you have uh, European cousins, etc. Everybody speaks three, four languages. I, I, I don't... I don't quite get this whole thing, but yet I grew up in America. I, I, know, what it, I know what they're talking about. Nevertheless, uh, Merton was, um, he, he spoke French, he spoke Latin, he spoke German, he spoke Spanish, he spoke Italian fluently, fluently. Um, and he was extremely impulsive um, and self-absorbed. And that would be, that would never leave him. And it doesn't leave any of us. Um, but it's really that latter, latter characteristic of being self-absorbed that precipitated, um, really, I think it was his mom fed that quite a bit. I'm not trying to be a psychologist, but she indulged him and she kept a daily diary recording his behavior when he was growing up until her second child, John Paul, was born. And then she died when Thomas, as I said, was six years old, uh, but her influence was already very, very important. Um, he had one other characteristic that really dominated, and that was ambitious. Now, if you want to talk about somebody, I'm not trying to give a confession here, who is impulsive, self-absorbed, and ambitious, guilty. You know, it's just real easy. By the way, your greatest strengths are your greatest? Thank you. So the very thing is, let's just say hypothetically, I'm not sure you, sure you guys would agree, but would you want your pastor or your priest to be compassionate? So do you think it might be a little out of sorts if he's sensitive? So, you know, you're like, well, just take it, you know, just. So the very thing is when you're there holding somebody who's dying and you're just so able to embrace those moments and be there and hold them and, and, and be totally at peace with all of that. Also can sometimes get in the way when somebody wants to take a shot and say, you know, put up your armor. So I can't tell you, God bless you all, but I have probably been asked the question, I would say 30, 35 times already. Um, It hasn't your week been just fine? You know? No problems. Just move on. And I, I, I just want to slap them. <laughs> it's like, are you kidding me? Are you kidding me? So I, I have a hunch it says more about them than it says about me. But you got to roll with it. 
Merton repaired much of his earlier omissions toward his newfound faith, and he began to follow, follow the Psalter of the Church's Divine Office. Boy, I, I just, you guys, with all the apps and all the technology, if you're not plugged in to the Divine Office, you're making a huge, huge mistake. I mean, now it is so easy. Okay, this is pathetic. Okay, this is pathetic. Deacon, don't, do, brother, don't pay attention. On these apps, they'll actually talk to you. They'll sing, inquire, they'll, they'll go through, especially for the holy days, like All Saints Day, and you're going to bed at night and you're going, look, I did evening prayer, Lord. That's really all that, you know, you really expected. me. I don't have the time or the attention span for night prayer. And, you know, it's only 13 minutes, but that's, I won't be, I, I can't, I can't do it. So I just hit that little app, and that sucker starts, and I'm going, this is good. And I stay awake for 13 minutes, and just fall asleep like a baby, because I just prayed with the whole church. And it was so easy. I know. Pathetic, too. Okay, but hey, use what you got. Um, he came to think that his vocation to the religious life was to really join the Franciscans. I, I think a lot of us think about that. Um, they eventually rejected him, and that was really hard on him. That didn't go over too well. Some months went by, <clears throat> and he, he had a conversation with a, one of the lecturer, le lecturers at Columbia, and uh, he, he, he kind of was encouraged to go for a retreat during Holy Week. And this is 1940 to a Cistercian monastery um, of Gethsemane, as I mentioned, in Kentucky. Um, this is a branch, by the way, of the of Reformed Order, the Cistercians of the Strict Observance. They're called Trappists. And his description of the effect upon him in Seven Story Mountain, as you well remember, is very, very memorable. <clears throat> he conceived the idea of applying to the Trappists. He applied, was accepted, and went in on December the 10th, 1941. Three days after the Japanese attack on Pearl Harbor, that's why it's easy to remember. And he was given the religious name Lewis. And um, subsequently he made his uh, profession on the Feast of St. Joseph. You know, for those of us who have gone through religious orders, in my case I had 11 years of religious order training um, prior to becoming a diocesan priest. Those are huge dates in our lives. <clears throat> and that was March the 19th. And his vows were solemn. Um, he, <clears throat> he made his so solemn perpetual vows three years later. Um, <clears throat> I was mentioning Seven Story Mountain had an incredible impact on the secular mindset of that time. It opened up a whole new vista of life uh, of earthly happiness, lived in such drastic opposition to the tenets of materialism. And that's why I think it's still so accessible today, isn't it? I mean, that's just so countercultural still. It drew thousands to the religious life. And it was translated into 15 different languages. I, I think it's as compelling today as the day it was published. And that's why I want you to not be, you know, betrayed. I'm not going to betray you or mislead you. That I'm not saying you need to read everything of Merton, but I do think that this um, is important. And let me just tell you, a lot of the bookstores agree, it has never been out of print. Never. Since the day it was published. So it is still very valuable today. And, and I would encourage it. <clears throat> 